I'm podcasting from the hills above Loch Allen. I'm trying to reach people far away. Hello, Helsinki, Glasgow, Brooklyn. This is Leitrim calling. I've an urge to tell the world who I am and where I am and what it's like to live in Leitrim. Although I still get things wrong, even though I've lived here for 30 years. Sometimes I say I'm living in Leitrim because the mountains and lakes of Leitrim are spread before me in understated beauty. My home is a few minutes down the road, but it's in Roscommon, actually. The good thing is neither me nor the sheep are fussy about county boundaries. In fact, the sheep don't care about any boundaries. Last week they broke into my garden, a mammy sheep and two big girl sheep, sitting in a single huddle beside the beach hedge. I took a photograph and texted it to a friend, saying that I had a new lawnmower. My friend has an automatic machine that crawls around the grass all summer long, keeping it manicured, but he lives in Mullingar, which is a very big, sophisticated city. The sheep stayed overnight at my door, and in the morning their droppings were everywhere. Droppings is a nice word for it, although only the two big girl sheep left droppings. The mammy sheep left huge mountains of black stuff like miniature slag heaps of coal, and you couldn't call it anything but shite. And I value shite. So I put it in a bucket and tossed it into the rose beds. My preferred word is dung, which my neighbour delivers from his cows every April, a box load on the back of a tractor, and I use it to feed the plants. I say dung, and he says manure, and neither of us use the S word, because there is something very violent about that word, shite. Calvin people, of course, always say the weather is shite when it's raining. In Leitrim we don't, because in Leitrim it rains so much that people pretend they don't notice. So I'm sitting in the hills above Loch Allen, pondering the meaning of sheep droppings. It's a political act. I'm turning my back on modernity. I want to be hugged and cherished and loved, just like everyone else, but I also love to be alone. And alone in the hills, I find a presence that draws me in and holds me when I walk alone. Loneliness comes with the dawn, an exquisite, beautiful loneliness, as the sun rises and I want to bathe in it forever. I was talking to a friend recently who also lives on high ground, and relishes the solitude of the hills. A man who has looked out his window for fifty years, enjoying the constancy of the landscape. The mountain changes from hour to hour, yes, but the mountain always remains the same. It's always there. The undulation of the land its slopes and drumlands, low-lying fields, and the hilly lanes that rise and weave themselves in familiar patterns around a human being, they all mattered to him. They were God's fingerprints, God shining in every quantum of the slanting sun, and he knew in his solitude that he was in love with the dawn. Because we are not alone in rural Ireland, even when we are alone. My friend mowed fields on the sloping hills with such precision each summer that he knew them like the back of his hand. He knew where the soggy ground was. He knew where the streams below the surface were. He knew what his little grey tractor could manage at every ditch and turn. The trouble is the land does change, 
imperceptibly, shaped and reshaped by human hands. Even I see it on ditches where once black thorn and wild rose and fuchsia bushes grew, but grow no longer. Because the roads were widened, Leitrim's wild roses were forgotten. I remember rushes that grew in the wet ground before it was drained, and the brown bog pools, and the syrupy streams of rusty ochre-coloured water that dribbled down through the ferrous rocks before it was planted. I remember old farmhouses, walled gardens, and old sheds that sank beneath the rising carpet of spruce on the sloping hills. Solitude is the gift of birds and bees, but in the darkest lair of the forest no bird sings and no bee hums. Solitude opens conversations with an entire galaxy of deities and sentient beings. I've watched farming men for forty years on mountain slopes, talking to goats in the dawn, remembering green trees that fell in winter storms, petting furry black-headed cattle in the fog, and wheelbarrowing fodder through rocky ground to reach their animals in winter blizzards that veiled both man and beast in a single silhouette of love. I've seen them go about their business untroubled by change and confident in the permanence of a love which can only be known by walking alone in the morning light. But not for any longer. Forestry swallows the houses first, then the townlands, and finally the memories of old men. A man looks out his window for fifty years, watching the mountain, and the mountain stands where it always stood, and the lake below is in his sights. Then forests come, and he grows weary, and too old to get off the chair beside the fire. Eventually he moves to lower ground, to pass his final days in a nursing home where no one has ever heard the sound of the townland where he was born, and where no one can read his fingers tapping out old tunes on the arm of a chair. Some day a nurse may ask him where he came from, and as he whispers a townland name, the nurse may or may not notice the tears in his eyes. <laughs>